professor of uh, pathology to speak to us today. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, well, we, we've sort of had uh, some uh, important uh, life cycle uh, talks the last uh, few weeks. Last week we learned about Social Security, and now we go directly uh, <laughs> to, uh, to autopsy. So, uh, but it's a great title. Uh, Why well, ask for an autopsy in the elderly? And uh, Dr. Fowler uh, uh, is the uh, residency program director, I think, for uh, pathology as well. So uh, he's, the, he's the man to ask. And it's, uh, the question is, is uh, just how relevant uh, autopsy is uh, today, and uh, and especially in the elderly population. I think I know what the answer is. So thanks. Not exactly a hot topic. When you get your first uh, magazine from the AARP when you turn 40, right? Yeah. This is not when the first. It's been so long ago that I can't remember when I get my first issue. Okay. Um, this is, uh, as I said before, uh, they can do printouts for you if you want from from this. Uh, as far as any references. Uh, this is basically, a large share of this is in regards to the talk that I tend to give all the residents uh, in training for the different departments as to differences between um, the medical examiner autopsy and a hospital autopsy. But uh, mainly, uh, and especially when it comes to geriatrics, it tends to be overcoming the uh, patient and clinician bias and certainly for autopsy it's not a it's not a patient choice first rule of business is patients can't opt to have their own autopsy they can donate it to an anatomic department of a medical school uh, of which there is no report of their cause of death etc that's produced uh, it is the family uh, the same uh, group that gets the rest of their uh, estate uh, that gets to choose whether or not uh, they have an autopsy. So it's usually uh, in discussion with the family. Yes? And the, pow and the power of attorney for health care that was appointed while the patient was uh, living is no longer No, it's no longer valid. Once they die, the power of attorney for their management of their health care is Stops. no longer uh, in service. now. Sometimes that same person that's been given a power of attorney is actually um, <coughs> given uh, the power to dispose of the body, especially if they have no family, etc., cetera, uh, by the state. And then they could be the ones to end up. But it's only after you go through the legal list of who can give permission by the state of Texas, which is very similar to most of the other states. So if you happen to be going to another state after uh, being here in Texas, uh, usually it's, it's pretty much the same order. And certainly, you know, for physicians uh, and the people caring for them, uh, well, don't we expect older people to die? So, you know, what's the whole idea of the autopsy? Uh, is it any value to the family? And I hope that I'll put across that there is definite value to the family because that's how you're going to sell the idea uh, of the autopsy. Anytime you try and sell anything to somebody, the question is, what's in it for me? Uh, and is there enough value uh, that they're willing to give permission? Uh, and what physicians usually say, or, or uh, nursing, is don't we get it only if we expect something went wrong? Uh, you know, uh, and uh, the other question is certainly, isn't it expensive? And I'll attempt to answer that, at least here at the Audie Murphy VA Hospital and over at the county hospital, uh, it is covered. If you have a valid patient number and uh, are under care of the clinics, etc., it is considered covered um, through Part A of Medicare, uh, and that the hospitals uh, provide them at no expense to the estate or to the patient's uh, bill. Um, it's the only free test that you can get while you're in the hospital. <laughs> but you have to go, you have to go through, uh, you pay a price, <laughs> I guess. Um, and then usually what they say, you hear from the family is they've been through an all, a lot. Uh, haven't they been through enough? And um, the question is, well, maybe, uh, maybe not. Uh, 
the, their suffering was occurring while they were living. There is no suffering uh, after death. Um, and that's true no matter what religion you may be. <laughs> okay? Uh, as far as I know, there may be a religion out there that I'm not aware of that uh, says that you can feel everything to your body after you die, but I don't know that. Uh, assist with info can use uh, when requesting. Uh, so what I'm going to do is try and provide you with information that you, you can utilize when asking to the family. I would also refer you, uh, and on the PowerPoint, if you bring this up on your own computer, this is a hot link to um, a CME program the state of Texas provides that you can actually get CME credit for. If you're unfamiliar with how to fill out a Texas uh, death certificate, because there are legal penalties for not filling it out properly or for just not refusing to do so, you can be found. Um, medical examiners are starting to go after physicians who do this and it's considered abandonment of care because any uh, person who dies who does not have a physician willing to complete a death certificate automatically becomes an ME case and then the county has to pick up the expense of a medical examiner as well as most of the medical examiners are extremely busy so they taken in recent years to pursuing physicians who seem to abandon that duty. Um, and I'll also briefly discuss with you uh, what kind of monitors that the hospital institutions have in place in regards to autopsy. Thanks. So, uh, your mission it would be to educate patients and particularly the families and as well as um, nationally what we need to start doing is uh, uh, encouraging our legislators and senators uh, to make all third-party payers uh, pay up uh, for the cost uh, because it is considered such a valuable quality assurance tool and you're always hearing about the quality assurance etc and how do we improve the delivery of health care and yet nobody seems to be willing to pay for um, the autopsies anymore, except for Medicare, and they've even been considering getting out of it. Texas did get out of it, as far as through uh, their third-party payers for uh, indigent patients. And so why should they be reimbursed? Well, quality assurance, patient safety, prevention of repetitive mistakes. It's interesting that in Texas, all incarcerated prisoners, whether in county jail, state prisons, even if they're on death row, if they die unexpectedly, um, must have a medical examiner uh, examination, and yet that's not true for the deaths of our elderly in nursing homes or other institutions, including hospitals, uh, where you would also be concerned about the potential for quality of care, and that's why Maloney and Maloney make so much money, because they can use conjecture to arrive at a jury decision rather than the facts of the case. And uh, it's also certainly indicated by recent uh, national reports, et cetera, which we'll go into some, to some degree. So, uh, Wall Street Journal back in 2003, here was an interesting article that you can still find in their archives in regards to how an autopsy could save your life. And I understand this, that pathologist also has a uh, television show, uh, I guess, that he's done. And, of course, the other one is on public uh, television. One of our former uh, medical examiners at the County Medical Examiners now in Florida, and she's on uh, public television and discusses autopsies uh, as well. Uh, but uh, how it can, that certainly through other new methods, uh, finding out about what you may be at risk to develop, uh, may be the last gift that your parents can can give you. Uh, also, uh, NPR, etc., had uh, this demise of the autopsy boats ill for science, mm -hmm. and they also had an article, uh, Buried Answers in New York Times. Also, if any of you have ever read, uh, read Joan Didion, Year of Magical Thinking, and there she discusses about her husband's death, uh, and later, of course, uh, her daughter's death, uh, especially since she came to great conflict of of trying to uh, go through her husband's and her uh, daughter's death. 
Um, so the approach to clinicians and families is the wrong approach, which unfortunately sometimes was the approach uh, in the past uh, and occurs a lot within <coughs> academic centers, is they seem to stress the importance for research, uh, et cetera, and uh, there's definitely nothing in that for a family. I mean, yeah, some families that are willing to donate all their organs and 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 may have a medical curiosity, but there's nothing really uh, in it for them uh, in that regards. Uh, what's really uh, valuable information for the genetic descendants of that is what are they at risk for developing. Just because mom or dad died of a myocardial infarction doesn't mean that there's pre-existing mm -hmm. breast cancer, uh, et cetera, that just so they may be very careful with their diet and exercise and not smoking and then uh, three years later develop breast cancer, uh, the family should know what their health risks are. And that's one of the major differences between a hospital autopsy and medical examiner's autopsy. A medical examiner's autopsy is mainly for the society's right to know was it accidental, was it suicidal, um, was it murder, or was it a natural death? And once they've determined the cause of death, uh, they're no longer interested in other things. So if the person has a some prostate cancer or breast cancer or whatever, that that may never be examined. They never look. They, they look at mainly for the cause of death. Where a hospital autopsy should, and especially within an academic center, tends to look at all existing diseases. So even if it didn't cause the death, it should be mentioned uh, in the autopsy report. And certainly it's information that clinicians can, whoops, clinicians can use. Uh, what's been shown by statistics where most uh, clinicians in a survey answer that they think that autopsies might be used against them, uh, in actuality of examination of possible litigation cases, the families actually felt that the physicians were being more open with them and that if they did go to court, quite often the juries came back with uh, less likely to convict or uh, with smaller awards because they were acting upon facts of the case rather than the conjecture that the uh, plaintiff's attorney is excellent at doing. So the best advice for physicians is uh, to try and get that autopsy. Uh, you may not, you certainly don't want to explain those facts to the family, especially if the family is already litigious. You wouldn't want to go up to them and say, uh, we'd like to get an autopsy on this case because it will help protect us. Uh, you would want to, uh, but we certainly all can make mistakes. Uh, so one recent case scenario was uh, from a thing that uh, I think illustrates my point uh, very well for the physicians taking uh, care of her, as well as uh, for the family, whether they accept the findings or not. Uh, but this was from a family that obviously had heard Mary Maloney's advertisements one too many. Uh, the woman had been told, and the family had been told, that she had Alzheimer's. Um, but because um, one physician offered a diagnosis of just low pressure hydrocephalus, uh, even though that can go along with Alzheimer's. The family, uh, the mother, uh, tended to link on this, and um, her daughter supposedly missed out on a terrific marriage to a Cambridge graduate because when he found out that there was Alzheimer's in the family, he refused to marry her daughter. And so uh, she wanted to sue the doctors for the false diagnosis of Alzheimer's that had destroyed her daughter's life. I have a feeling her future husband-to-be had met his future mother-in-law, and I'd already made that decision because I've spent long hours on the phone with the family uh, uh, in this case. Um, at uh, autopsy, it was not only established that the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, but also lung carcinoma, uh, metastatic related to her smoking history. We received a nine-page document from the daughter of this woman that detailed every possible litigious thing that had occurred in this woman's life to the fact that 
Uh, she had been a radiology technician and been exposed to radiation, to living in uh, West, raised in West Oklahoma that had something in the soil. Uh, she had been a former roofer at one time and they knew she had been exposed to asbestos. Um, and uh, she had been in a four different nursing homes, uh, of which the daughter was accusing all four nursing homes of nursing home abuse. Um, and they had placed her on a ventilator for the past year of this woman's life so that the woman was completely non-communicative. And of course they were not aware that she had this cancer so she was kept alive with this cancer that was metastatic throughout her bones and stuff without pain medication or anything else and unable to speak on the ventilator. which. I think is kind of cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, and uh, so here is the brain, and I think you can see the ventricular system definitely looks dilated. The gyri of the cortex uh, appears to be widened. And microscopically, we saw the senile plaques and tangles that confirm the diagnosis. We note that related to her smoking, uh, that white area uh, down here, uh, in the posterior wall, we know that this is the posterior because this is the flat wall where this is the anterior wall. She had an old myocardial infarction. Um, what the, the family was so caught up in her social history in the nine pages, they forgot to mention she had a Greenfield filter placed in her inferior vena cava in the past year. Uh, and so we found the Greenfield filter, and that was in fine position, et cetera, and shows that they had treated her very satisfactorily and no complications from the Greenfield filter. Uh, here's a slice of her liver, which shows these huge mets. Uh, this is a certainly large one. It's kind of cut bifold here, but there were other smaller ones throughout, so that's what a metastasis of adenocarcinoma lung can look like. Uh, this is her lumbosacral spine, and this whole mass here, actually there's a wedge through this, and you see the, the cut section shows this creamy yellow material, and that is uh, adenocarcinoma metastatic to her, her spine. And uh, another scenario that we just recently had, uh, not elderly, but certainly could have been, 58-year-old woman that had a long history of full-onset diabetes mellitus and had had an implanted cardiac defibrillator for possible, uh, turns out they had said non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, but it had never really been worked up. And she also had hypertension, hyperlipidemic chronic renal failure. She underwent a successful mitral valve uh, replacement because she had developed uh, severe mitral insufficiency. Um, and they, at the time of the surgery, uh, had noted new lung nodules and they assumed that that was related to her amiodarone. And unfortunately the picture that I have or the crosscut wasn't very good, but it looked like the pacemaker was in place, and that's uh, important. This is one of these defibrillating type of pacemakers. But we also saw uh, the nodules went in her lung, and when we did sections, uh, we actually found that this was all non-caseating granulomas throughout the heart and lungs. Uh, we did stains for TB and fungi, which were all negative, and this, she actually had sarcoidosis but never received active treatment. So uh, it shows that uh, certainly this is an education for her physicians who were caring for this non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. They had made that diagnosis correct. But frequently, in an older person with multiple problems, sometimes we err on the side of not doing an aggressive uh, workup. So um, we're going to be presenting this uh, certainly at one of the uh, internal medicine rounds because, uh, of course, the the person who kind of gets blamed for this is the surgeon, but he didn't do the workup. He did everything right. He replaced the heart valve. And um, other cases we've had, uh, sometimes we had this one person who died of a myocardial infarction over here. He was an elderly man. 
and when we did the complete exam, what we found was that he had medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, and uh, of course medullary carcinoma uh, thyroid can be genetic and associated with ret proto oncogene, uh, and so uh, the families who are then the descendants of this person would need to be tested, mm -hmm. and if positive, uh, should have uh, prophylactic thyroidectomies to prevent uh, medullary carcinoma. So, um, examples such as this can be certainly utilized to encourage the family uh, to ask for an autopsy, even when the cause of death is obvious. And that's what I want to stress, is that uh, yes, the person is 98 years old uh, and had a bad heart, but should we be looking for other things that the family uh, might have? Because uh, with each generation, usually a malignancy will show up 10 or maybe 20 years earlier in subsequent generations. Autopsies. Uh, historically have always been kind of for the cause of death and they kind of initiated in the 1600s. Whoops. Uh, the touch pad is a little sensitive here. The, uh, the, I've got uh, two of his or, uh, original books by Morgagni and make for uh, really interesting reading because uh, that was kind of pre-microscope and uh, so everything that <coughs> was swollen was automatically a tumor or neoplasm. Uh, it was funded by some third-party payers, uh, such as Blue Cross, et cetera, as educational, uh, but it was abandoned during the 70s and 80s. And also the uh, uh, ACGME removed that as a requirement. There used to be requirements for every uh, section, such as medicine, surgery, et cetera, for, that they had to have a certain percentage of their deaths have an autopsy or they were not accredited and they abandoned that uh, in recent years. Uh, one reason for that has been the overconfidence in modern imaging and lab tests and we're certainly going through another round of that currently. So which suggested that autopsy was archaic but it's amazing um, in trying to determine histology from shadows uh, that the differential diagnosis. Actually, these newer methods have sometimes limited the differential diagnosis rather than improve uh, the diagnosis. And one of the major offenders have been pathologists in private practice uh, have tended to discourage because uh, of the poor reimbursement. And a lot of hours are spent uh, upon the autopsy when you can make a lot more money by signing out appendixes and gallbladders, uh, et cetera, for something that the insurance companies reimburse for. And so uh, many pathologists in private practice will do their utmost to avoid having to do an autopsy. Uh, in fact, there are some practices that refuse to do them, and if you want to do an autopsy, you have to get a special uh, private company to, to do that. Uh, and as I said, the Joint Commission uh, also removed the percentage requirements for hospitals, uh, just like the ACGME. So um, I think we've kind of always already done this. It's not only for uncertain diagnosis or cause of death, it's also for quality improvement as well as self-protection. Uh, yet, uh, with the prior evidence that this was useful as an educational tool and that we're bound to repeat mistakes that we don't know were mistakes. If you're not told that you made a mistake, then how are you ever, what are you going to do to correct it? It's not going to work. It's important. The things that I remember the best are my worst mistakes, <laughs> uh, whether in life or in medicine, okay? Um, it's, it's always more fun if it's somebody else's mistake that you can learn a lot too, but it's, uh, but I think the ones, our worst mistakes that we've all had within medicine, I think we, we remember them till the day we would die. And certainly the, um, uh, to err is human, building a safer health system was published 
uh, by the Institute of Medicine, and that estimated that 44,000 to 98,000 Americans die each year, not from the medical conditions they checked in with, but from preventable medical errors. And certainly, their statistics and data may be flawed in that report, but it's certainly gotten a lot of press, and it's gotten a lot of politicians uh, aimed at reporting medical errors. Uh, Clinton and Obama had a bill uh, before the legislature uh, that uh, was going to require federal reporting of all medical errors, and yet it didn't go into, you know, which medical errors do you, you know, what level of medical errors do you report, and yet nothing in this uh, suggested any improved fundings or impro uh, requirements for doing autopsy again. Uh, they just don't seem to recognize that autopsy is a quality assurance tool. Um, hospital autopsy versus ME exam. For the hospital autopsy, permission is needed. It tends to be a complete autopsy. Other diseases besides cause of death may be found. And that includes the diseases that relatives may be at risk for, where the ME exam is the mandatory by state law, no permit required. Uh, autopsy varies in detail and will stop at the cause of death. Uh, Texas medical examiner cases, certain deaths uh, must be reported if the person dies while in jail or prison. Uh, all suspected non-natural death except by legal execution. Um, so uh, if a body or even a part of a body is found, uh, if you find a limb in the trash, that has to go to the MEs office. The person dies without having been attended by a physician, uh, such as deaths on arrival and emergency room deaths, all have to be referred uh, to the medical examiner. And then also in Texas, every child below the age of six uh, who dies is automatically an ME, which has to be referred to the ME's case. They may decline to do an autopsy and allow the autopsy to be done at the hospital, but they have to <coughs> first be referred to the ME's office. Uh, university health system, in their literature, uh, asked for deaths with unknown or explained complications. One of the ones that have just recently uh, been in the press, I seem to move forward rather than finding my arrow here, uh, are in regards to deaths of patients in clinical trials IRB, and the recent one that was reported in the New York Times and Washington Post. Uh, which uh, was Jolie K. Moore, a 36-year-old in Taylorville, Illinois, who from her rheumatologist was getting um, a gene product uh, via an adenovirus injected into the joints and died. And um, the drug company and rheumatologist uh, did not report it. Um, and yet uh, it should have been reported to the FDA. And plus, um, initially, they, they may not have gotten an autopsy. And it's very important that any uh, patients on a clinical trial, it should probably be a requirement of the IRBs to require autopsies, whether they think it was related to the trial therapy uh, or not. Um, the death certificate, which you as clinicians are required to fill out, is your clinical impression, okay? So it may not be the necessarily the anatomic facts of the case, but it's your clinical impression. And so um, the death certificate is filled out by the clinician and is your best clinical impression of why that person died. You can always go back and modify your death, the death certificate after the autopsy, but at least in the state of Texas, the pathologist is not the person caring for them, et cetera. Now, if it's an ME case, then you're forbidden to complete the certificate. So if the person comes in and dies in the, without physician attendance or all those things that were ME cases, don't fill out a death certificate because that's uh, a requirement of the ME office. Those are the only pathologists that fill out the death certificate. But for a hospital death, you fill out the death certificate and then should provide a copy of that along with the rest of the charge to the pathologist 
that then they go through, and the autopsy is the anatomical evidence. So just like you do your history and physical and a differential diagnosis and come up with a diagnosis, uh, the lab, the autopsy is the lab part, and that either confirms your clinical impression or raises other questions, uh, et cetera. And then you should be uh, certainly notified of that. And so discovery of the familial risk for an illness is usually not the cause of death and may not be even identifiable by their death certificates. Uh, how to complete the death certificates, I showed you before, but it's the Texas Department of Health website. There's step-by-step -step info and you can get the CME credit. Uh, on the autopsy form over at University Hospital, the back of the form uh, has information on how to do that as well as the order to ask. I've requested from the VA uh, several times to have a similar autopsy form over here, and they do not. In fact, the autopsy forms we get here, we're lucky if we have the physician's name. So usually we have to do a search of the chart to try and find it. And if there's anybody here that has the power to change the VA, uh, <laughs> Please speak up, uh, let yourself be known so that we can get this accomplished because it's to help the trainees, you know. Uh, we don't all walk around with this information in our head all the time. So uh, anyways, that information is on the back. Um, Are there differences in autopsy rates at two major teaching hospitals? Uh, it is less over here at the VA than it is at UHS. but. Um, it's, it's not that much less. Uh, there is a 100% requirement of asking the families with ways of documenting for autopsy at both institutions. So therefore the rates should be somewhat uh, similar. And the only exception for that is the ECTC. Uh, um, and uh, the reason for that is because uh, for the terminal care that was felt not to necessarily be required. Um, the places that uh, in other countries where the autopsy rates have stayed high or at in certain institutions where autopsy rates have stayed high, and we're pretty much in the average when I compare with across the country. So we're not the only institutions that have low autopsy rates. It seems to be true throughout the United States. In fact, we're probably near the top uh, in the United States. But it suggests that by using the autopsy information for feedback, uh, less of these diagnostic mistakes tend to occur. Um, we have a quality risk uh, scoring system at our institution, which is not part uh, of the autopsy report. So when the family gets the autopsy report, they don't get this information, so you don't have to be concerned about that. But the quality risk score is zero means that there's no discrepancies found between what we found on the autopsy versus what was in the clinical chart. Uh, a one is a minor finding and without any type of patient risk. Uh, a two is that there was a major finding such as uh, finding uh, lung cancer that was never diagnosed ahead of time, etc. But it had no effect on the patient outcome and the reasons have to be given. So what I would write on the back would be say, well, the person died of myocardial infarction. They were going to die of myocardial infarction. And that uh, if this had been undiscovered in a, another patient, why well, maybe they would have died of lung cancer. So it's a major finding, but in some instances, it really had no effect. Three is where you have a major discrepancy and uh, with probable negative impact uh, on patient outcome. Usually the way we do it is that it, we usually only use the three if there appears to be definitive negative impact on patient outcome because the clinicians get called to the quality risk management committee and uh, have to answer uh, some questions in, in that regard. So, uh, but 
we prefer the term probable negative impact because even though this is supposed to be non-discoverable, if it became discoverable, mm -hmm. we we don't want to be the jury. Okay, so that's why we say probable. Um, and again, it's not reported with the autopsy or communicated to the fa family, and only QRMs of three tend to be reported to the institution's QRM committee for review, and they're not supposed to be this way. Uh, some misconceptions about autopsies is uh, cost. Uh, most people think it's very expensive, even at those uh, doing autopsies far as outside where there is a charge, most of them are under $1,500, which is uh, kind of less than the total body scan. Um, and that's why pathologists don't like doing them uh, in private practice, because there's you know, where radiologists love doing scans. Uh, it's impossible, uh, but at our institutions, know that when you talk, communicate with a family, you can tell them that there's no charge to the patient or to the estate from the VA or University Hospital. If you're down at Santa Rosa, you may have to ask. Uh, I know some of our residents rotate down there. Uh, a lot of people give up because they just say it's impossible to get permission in this community. Uh, yet, when asked and where it's explained well, and again, explaining the benefit to the uh, deceased family uh, in regards to there may be something that the pathologist can find that you are at risk. Obviously, if they're not genetically related, that's, that's going to be a weak argument, etc. Uh, but it works best, and you get a, a more likely answer if the family is educated as to the purpose of autopsy. I think the other thing that always happens around here is we have one team that rotates through the daytime and is communicating with patient and family, and then we have uh, night shift, and frequently it is the night shift that ends up having to ask for the permission for autopsy, and they're not familiar with the families uh, and patient as well, and I think that kind of complicates things as far as trying to get permission. Uh, many people feel it's disfiguring, uh, and the answer is no, and it certainly doesn't preclude an open casket, and that even includes with the brain, the way that the skull is taken off, etc. Uh, unless you're standing up the patient so that they have a 360 degree view, uh, uh, then they might see some sutures. But uh, the skull is sewn back into place and you cannot tell that they, they had. Uh, we don't go through the face. Uh, we avoid any type of uh, disfigurement, especially of hands, face, etc. because uh, we we also want to keep our local morticians happy and because uh, morticians are trying to keep their families happy so we try and be very careful about those things. Uh, uh, one thing is we never get a report and part of that is because in order to do the full autopsy and do the brain and getting all the reports back and consolidating them, it does take a, it does take a time. The CAP suggest having the results within 30 working days, and that is our requirement. Uh, we've been pretty much meeting that uh, most of the time, and I uh, kind of have to whip some of our residents, uh, sometimes more as the faculty, uh, into making sure that those reports are available. Uh, we've tried to take new pains in um, letting people know before the autopsy starts uh, trying to find those names in, in the chart, notifying them before the autopsy starts, so if they want to come down and, and participate in the autopsy like a real consultation, they can. Uh, it's been real helpful for like transplant surgeons and everything else because quite often the residents and fellows on the team can go through and explain to us exactly what they did and check their own sutures so that they can sleep better uh, immediately the night, next night, etc. Uh, and plus we learn a lot from it. And then we call back within 24 hours with a preliminary anatomic diagnosis and then uh, try and notify you verbally when we've put it into the computer where you can find it via the computer. The, what happens is the uh, uh, 
I'm going to skip this because you already know this, and most of you. Is there any first year resident in here? No. Right. So I'll skip that. Um, and we've already discussed that. I was trying to put on the for the reports. The family does not get uh, the reports automatically from either institution. Uh, they get a letter stating uh, autopsy has been completed once the final anatomic diagnosis is done and that the clinician has already been contacted and a copy sent to medical records and a copy uh, should be available in the computer to the clinicians. Then the family is notified that the autopsy is complete and we ask them and we give them the name of the clinician that we have to contact that physician to discuss the autopsy report. Now if for some reason they don't feel comfortable meeting with that physician or not, then uh, they don't have to and legally they can get the copy of the autopsy report through medical records. Uh, but I think it's always better for uh, the clinicians, and I certainly did this when I was in internal medicine, it's better to go over the autopsy report with the family. I think it's, it settles a lot of questions that they may have. Uh, one thing I know from being in private practice is sometimes the autopsy reports from academic centers can be hard for clinicians to read through. I've tried to encourage our residents to only put in the really pertinent information and under gross and microscopic descriptions of other things rather than all this verbiage that just mainly means it looks normal to say no gross abnormalities or no microscopic abnormalities and only put in the abnormal. So that way you're not left trying to explain normal to the patient's family who doesn't like, understand that. Uh, but if ever you should have any questions feel free to contact I or whoever the pathologist's name is on the report to explain what is written on the autopsy report. Yes? So it, is the communication with the family then left up to the family's discretion? It's uh, left up to the fam family's discretion. And uh, if, if then there were a major rationale for the autopsy is to uh, communicate with the family, what percentage of family members who get this letter request that uh, discussion with the Yeah, physician. that's unfortunately between the two institutions, that's a loop that we've had problems documenting the closure of. I hate to ask the question, but, uh, <laughs> but given, given the, uh, the Byzantine nature of communications within and without the hospitals, uh, are we certain that that these letters we know do that. Go, do go oh yes, yes. Uh, I do know that at least at University Hospital, I know they go out because it's our deaner, our employee within the autopsy department that sends them out. Over here at the VA, I'm never quite certain who is in charge of sending out those reports to the family. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to change which is another institutional uh, problem. Uh, so it's certainly something else that we've tried. I've been director of autopsy for the three years, and I've been trying to solve these problems. Uh, some we've solved, some we've improved upon. Uh, I have sw sway over my residents, sometimes over my faculty, but the institutions, I think you can support me on this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough battle. Uh, they've been here much longer than we have, uh, trying, trying to get things to change. Um, but I do know that some families have asked because uh, I've had clinicians contact me and say they can't find the report mm -hmm. or something. And so I do know that families have, have contact. Um, in regards to completing the autopsy, uh, this only works if you're over at the UHS because the reverse of the permit over here doesn't have anything to work on. Uh, who can grant autopsy permission? Uh, just so that you're aware, if the patient is not a legal adult, then 
uh, is basically the parent, or the next is the legal guardian. Uh, the sibs, etc. Even if the sib is of legal age, doesn't really enter into it for pediatrics. Um, though they might be the legal guardian. Uh, the, if the patient is a legal adult, then the person who first must be asked is the spouse. Um, if they do not have a spouse or are legally divorced, and the key thing is it's not a matter of not being able to reach them, they have to be legally uh, separated or deceased, uh, then it has to be the spouse. Uh, otherwise, it will fall to the child or a guardian of the child which is interesting because in Texas you can be legally divorced but your spouse, if they are the guardian of the child, may still have say over whether or not you get an autopsy. And then third on the list is parent and then next it would be a sibling uh, and legal guardian. And sometimes the institutions will step in because there may be only one contact uh, as far as for the person who is willing to see to the burial, et cetera, and the state will say that if they wish, they can be the one to uh, request an autopsy, et cetera, just as they would be the ones that would be getting rid of the rest of the state. The information that I need as a pathologist and other pathologists need as well is mainly your name and how to reach you. And if you could just write that on the form, even if there's no place for it on the form, uh, then communications improve remarkably. You'll know more about the autopsy and get much better feedback uh, if we know who you are. Uh, and it's certainly helpful for us because we get a true differential diagnosis, uh, et cetera, and we can keep you up to date as we find information. Uh, of course, we can go into the computer and get things in regards to labs, uh, radiology, and clinical course. Um, mainly the parts of the autopsy is we always do a chart review first, and we do an external ex uh, inspection. We review all lab tests that have been done. Uh, certainly if the person's been in the hospital and been on antibiotics, we're not interested in doing other tests such as blood cultures, etc. However, if we notice that uh, that was not part of the therapy, et cetera, then quite often we get that or we may get uh, toxicology, et cetera. But, and that's become a hot topic across the United States right now because quite often uh, on that, uh, as far as organs retained, et cetera, we don't retain them for research. We only retain them for a period of six months in which we may go back if we feel like we found something that we didn't visually see and try and get more of it so that we can make sure that we have an accurate uh, autopsy. However, um, a case in Massachusetts uh, was that the child died and the um, family thought he had been entirely buried and they discovered that the heart was not buried with the child and uh, with stuff in the press and they have a huge website is our child was all heart and to have buried and now he's in pieces uh, to be buried without their heart so in Massachusetts now they have to give approval for every organ that is potentially retained uh, it makes for a very long autopsy permit form um, anyways uh, you, the PAD is the preliminary anatomic report just based upon the gross findings and then we do microscopics of the various organs. We may do toxicology, cultures, other post-mortem tests and then once we have all of those things put together, uh, especially if it's brain, the neuropathologist does the brain and spinal cord part. Um, we put that all together for the final report, which should be done within 30 uh, working days, and most of the time it is. Um, and I've already reviewed that and told you the same thing, that we'll try and contact you just before dissection immediately after, uh, etc. And that we do not send a report directly to the family, just that it's been completed and here's a person that we really <coughs> can discuss it with you. Some places the pathologist discusses the findings with the family. 
And I've been approached about doing that, and because of my years of clinical work, I could do that, but I feel then the question is the clinicians are always questioning what was communicated to the family. And it can make for a difficult working relationship because families, you may tell family one thing, and I'm sure you've even done it among yourselves, tell family one thing, and then the family goes to another clinician and repeats what they thought they heard, not necessarily what you said. And the same thing can happen with autopsy findings, and that's why I've avoided doing that, but I'd be interested in your input as to whether you think it's a good idea for the pathologists to discuss the findings with the family versus having you be the first line, uh, if possible. Um, and uh, anyway, so those are the things. And it goes to the clinician of record. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes the clinician of record is the person who's seen the patient the least sometimes. So that's why we've been trying to scan through the chart and figure out who's, who's really been seeing the patient, not who the admitting physician was, uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, we already covered that. Some lessons learned in the past 14 years at our medical center. Overall, I think we do a very uh, good job. There have been a rare case, uh, one that we found a uh, narcotic level 10 times the therapeutic dose that we then had to turn over to the medical examiners for their examination. Uh, they took over, as soon as we refer them, they take over the case and we just uh, walk away from that. Uh, one thing that we have found, found especially in the terminal care, uh, and this may come up in ECTC, et cetera, uh, is the controversy over feeding ostomies. Uh, there, um, you know, it's a, it's a very uh, conflicting uh, discussion that can occur with feeding ostomies as far as keeping the patient alive, et cetera, and there's a lot of controversial articles written about it. But uh, locally, we found a major problem, especially in the elderly and the confused, as far as the problem of pulling the ostomies uh, with subsequent uh, peritonitis and death. So uh, I think that's good to know about as you're considering potentially ordering a feeding ostomy too, uh, locally. We also had learned a few years back that some physicians uh, had pushed the limits of physician extenders uh, and it resulted in immediate change in things. Uh, the chief of staff here at the VA issued a ultimatum to the faculty uh, because, you know, we do have uh, PAs here, etc. And um, having your you electronically put in progress notes while you're in Europe like you're actually rounding is probably a bad idea. Uh, and that occurred in one death, uh, you know, which I won't go into details, but uh, the physician was not on the continent, and yet the progress notes looked like he was. Uh, and also we discovered for surgeons trying to squeeze tumor intravascularly back towards the tumor has dire consequences. We had a few cases, now that they're doing a lot of laparotomy surgeries, um, they try and get a clean surgical margin and on the vessels, they try and push it one way. Well, what frequently happens if you try and push it back to get a clean surgical margin is you also embolize it. And we've seen several uh, immediate intraoperative deaths from pulmonary emboli of tumor uh, when that occurs. So um, this information is always shared with the clinicians, et cetera, first, and um, I think that it has been uh, valuable uh, to get that, and um, the autopsy reports don't say directly uh, such and such cause. We don't reach any conclusions. We just report what we see and somebody else has to draw the conclusions from that so that 
a family reading it, et cetera, and just because there's tumor in the lung doesn't necessarily state that perhaps that they had pushed the tumor into the lung, uh, et cetera. So we're, we try and be very careful. And that was something I was going to try and bring up before. If you read a autopsy report, and since you have uh, kind of a first look at it, if you don't like the way things are worded, please call us or please bring it to my attention. And I'm happy to try and soften the language uh, because these are sometimes originally written up by young residents um, who are feeling fearless sometimes uh, and very brave. I know when back in the early part of my career, I, I was invincible. Uh, Etc. And it was easier to blame, put blame on other people rather than <coughs> myself. Um, we, things can be reworded in the autopsy report. Uh, let's put it that way. Okay. So if things seem harsh or whatever, uh, let us know, and we're happy to re-see. And uh, this just goes over the current hot, hot topic for uh, uh, retention of. of Tissues, and I think it's very important to keep the public educated. In regards to that. So, well, I've kind of run over. Of course, we've had a little list out there. Or is it supposed to be 12 15? Oh, it's one. Okay, so that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions. To what extent do you and faculty have a supervisory role in each and every autopsy uh, performed by? Uh, yeah, we're ultimately responsible, and where usually uh, I'm always try to be the faculty that is on the first two weeks that uh, any new resident is on the autopsy service, and because I can withstand standing up next to the table and being with them throughout the entire procedure, which may vary from two to three to four hours at the grossing table. Uh, of course, we have very good uh, trained deaners. That's not always been the case over here at the VA, but we recently revised that uh, after a few years of work. Uh, that we have very well trained deaners that have uh, even sometimes more experience than even I have uh, at the grossing table. And that once that they've got several autopsies under the belt, then uh, I encourage the faculty to only you come in, kind of review the chart, go over, make sure that we have a valid permit, etc. Um, before the autopsy, discuss what we're going to be looking for, etc. And then they can walk away and then come back at the end of the autopsy and review all the organs. And then uh, always once a week, we have a gross conference where all faculty and residents uh, we go over the gross organs and we can raise questions at that time. Uh, and that's another reason for the need for retention of the organs so that more than one set of eyes can look at them. And then, of course, all microscopics are signed out. Uh, the, the residents review them first, bring them to the attending. The attending reviews all those microscopics with them. The residents write it up, but then it's the faculty's job to review the entire report uh, wordsmith it as needed uh, and uh, be signing on the bottom line. So their signature says they take credit for you know, being involved in all parts of the autopsy. So in pathology, there's a lot more, nothing gets signed out without the faculty being at the uh, as far as the Because ultimately, such major decisions, whether it's in surgery or whatever, are being made based upon search path report and all that sort of report for mm -hmm. psychology. Other questions? Uh, I had a question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're from the truth, but I see at the university. <clears throat> if there's a trauma patient, I was told that they have to have a mental examiner. Right, because, uh, because the, uh, the trauma patients were from an accidental injury. Mm -hmm. And if a person uh, was involved in an accident even 20 years ago and maybe ended up having quadriparesis. 
and 20 years later finally succumbs from pneumonia related to the quadriplegics, that's still an MEs case. Mm -hmm. They still may bring uh, homicide charges, uh, involuntary homicide against the driver of the other car 20 years later. They, they have that possibility. So anything that results of a known accident or trauma, et cetera, which is, uh, have to be referred to the MEs first. Now the ME said, okay, this is clear cut. We're not, you know, we're not interested and we're not going to do an autopsy. Uh, the family still has the option that they sign the permit. The family can still get a hospital autopsy. Unfortunately, what sometimes has happened with those coming through the emergency room is the body is first transferred over to the ME's office, even if they've got a valid autopsy permit to be done at the hospital. And because the ME's office has a contract with a certain ambulance service, it takes them right to the, that funeral home or wherever and transports them only once. And it's a matter of trying to get the body to come back to the institution for us to do an autopsy that's become part of the problem. And the trauma surgeons uh, especially are troubled by this because they they lose the immediate follow-up because when the patient goes to the ME's office, there may not be an autopsy report for six months or something. Another lecture at 1.30. Oh. Okay. Thank you very much. If you haven't signed in yet, please do so. We need everybody to sign in. Who's going to keep the CD for?